God is good all the time. You know, a lot of times when we say that, I think some people think, well, they've just got it made. You know, God is good all the time. But, you know, I didn't say that there's not tribulation. Uh, The Bible said that we would have tribulation in this world. If you live in the world, there will be tribulation. But count it all joy. Amen. Amen. He has overcome the world. And so we have to be enforcers, and we have to uh, be like the Shunammite woman. Remember, my slogan is, all is well. The Lord spoke that to me as I was praying one day, and he reminded me when her son had died, and she, uh, now most mothers would have been just kind of going crazy, and everybody asked, what was going on? Why do you need the prophet? And what's going on? I am well. I, it is well. I mean, it is well. And she never she never backed off of it is well, and she saw her son raised from the dead. Amen. I tell you, is God not the same today as he always has been? Yes, he is. He is the same. Well, pastor asked me, this is the last uh, prayer tonight, right? The last, the last segment of prayer that's been going on since the first of the year. But he asked me to wrap it up tonight. And so uh, he asked me to speak about a certain thing, and we are going to get to that. But the Holy Ghost started taking me in a little different direction uh, as I was studying and preparing. And so the the title of this tonight is Prayer Works by Love. Prayer Works by Love. Uh, And you'll see in a minute what I'm talking about. In Galatians 5, verse 6, this verse teaches us, that faith works by love. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. It, it, you can't work your faith if you're not in love, right. if you're not walking the love walk. Amen. And so if faith works by love, it's fair to say that prayer also works by love because any time we come to prayer, we have to use faith. Now, I understand that there's actually a prayer of faith, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. I'm talking about when you go into prayer, you have to have faith that God hears you. You have to have faith that God answers. I mean, really, what would be the use of praying if we didn't know that God hears us and if we didn't know that God answers? We would just be sending up SOS signals. You know, if you're there, you know, have you ever heard somebody say, well, if there is a God or if you're there, you know, do this. I'm mm, you're probably out of luck because you don't throw fleeces out to God. Not in this day, maybe in the Old Testament, but not now. So our prayer works by love. Now in Romans 5, verse 5, it says in this verse that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So if you're born again, you have the love of God in your heart, in your spirit. Now, you may have tamped it down so much that you can't find that love that you don't see that love. You may have walked in hate or, or uh, not, I hate that word hate, <laughs> but you may, you may have walked in uh, disobedience or you may have walked in uh, offense against people. And so you've quenched that love that has been shed abroad in your heart. But I got good news. It doesn't take long to start drawing it out. So we're gonna and we're gonna talk about that tonight. Now we all know First Corinthians thirteen as a love chapter. If you ask anybody, even people that aren't Christians, they could probably tell you what First Corinthians thirteen says. They could probably quote the whole thing because they've heard it at weddings. You know, uh, most weddings at some point they're gonna quote this. They're gonna quote First Corinthians thirteen because it's known as the love chapter. But, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13, it is, it is all about love. But if you, if you study it out, you'll see that Paul was writing to the church in the Greek city of Corinth. And if you know anything about Corinth, Corinth, it was a, it was a merchant city. And it had become very prosperous because of its location. 
And so as it grew in prosperity, every, it also grew in every evil work. You know, the, the, it just started being a, a, a hub of sin, basically a hub of sin. And so what happened is all the pagan, uh, all these activities, all the immorality, it, it started sifting over into the church. And the church people started acting like the world. And that makes me think about the day we're living in today. There's a lot, of, a lot of times you can't tell the difference in the called out ones, the church. You can't tell a difference in that than the world. And so, what, so the world was creeping in on the church and they was just all kind of, I won't even go into all the sin that was going on. And so Paul, led by the Holy Ghost, wrote them a letter. It had been a while since he had been there and things had just gone downhill since he had been there. And so he wrote them a letter because he was deeply concerned about their spiritual welfare. And you know, even today as Christians, we should be deeply concerned about the state of the church as a whole. Not just faith family, of course, but as a whole. We have a good church, I mean. And so uh, Paul wrote to them under the direction of the Holy Spirit and uh and he said some things in this chapter. And I'm, you know, we're going to read the entire chapter. Now, we've got other things to say, but we are going to go through this entire chapter. Because I don't believe we actually study it enough. There was a time when I had it laminated. Remember the old-timey fridges? Now, nothing to stick to the stainless steel. But the old-timey fridge, you could just stick magnets all over your fridge. And I had magnets. And I had uh, the... This 1 Corinthians 13, I had it laminated and I had it on my refrigerator so I could just look at it all the time. I could see it and I could read it. And so uh, when we begin to see ourselves in here, because, you know, the Bible's a mirror that we're to look in and say, oh, yeah, that's me. That's me. I found myself in the Word. And, and when we look at it, we begin to grow because we meditate on the Word. That's how we grow. We meditate and we grow. Now, the King James, uh, it translated the word love as charity in this verses. But see, I like the Amplified. He teases me about the Amplified. That's okay. Or somebody was teasing me about it. That's okay. But it's the closest to the original. And that's why I like it, the Amplified Classic. And that's what I'm going to read it out of tonight. So verse 1 says, if I can speak in the tongues of men and even of angels, but have not love, that reasoning, intentional, spiritual devotion, such as is inspired by God's love for us and in us. Thank God he didn't just love us, he put his love in us. So if I speak in tongues and I don't have the love, I am only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, there's people all over the earth today that are praying in tongues, but their love walk is messed up. And so in God's ears, it's just a clanging noise. It's not going anywhere. Verse 2, and if I have prophetic powers, the gift of, in, of interpreting the divine will and purpose and understand all the secret truths and mysteries and possess all knowledge. And if I have sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, God's love in me, I am nothing, a useless nobody. Without God's love, now that's not very, that's not very inspiring, is it? Without God's love, I'm a useless nobody. Yay! No. <laughs> that's not very inspiring, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Without operating in his love that has been shed. You know, if his love had not been shed abroad in our hearts, we could just say, like the church I grew up in said, we're just old sinners saved by grace, just old worms in the dust, and we'll always be worms in the dust. But see, that all changed when Jesus died for us. It all changed. We're not worms anymore, praise God. And God wants us to be elevated even more by our love walk. Our love walk should be so much different than the world. We should not, 
react as the world. When somebody rubs us the wrong way, we shouldn't react like the world reacts. And you know, in this day and time, people can be just cruel. People can be just mean. Just mean people. But it's not the people, it's the spirits driving them. And that's what we have to understand. So, we're, we're nobody if we don't have love. Uh, verse 3, even if I give out all that I have to the poor in providing food, and if I surrender my body to be burned, or in order that I may glory, but have not love, God's love in me, I gain nothing. See, if you give just to be recognized, or, you know, when you give to the poor, but then you put it on Facebook, what you did, and tell, tell all your friends, put it on social media, look at me, look at me. You know, th- that's, not what, that's not what God's called us to do. You know, when we give to the poor, we give in secret, and God rewards us openly. That's what the Word says. So, verse 4. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Now, I mentioned earlier that this is said at weddings, and really, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But actually, this, was being, this letter was being sent to the church, not just for newlyweds. Not just newlyweds being patient and kind. So love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious. It doesn't boil over with jealousy. It's not boastful or vainglorious. You know, you're so vain. You probably thought this song was about you. Not vainglorious. Does not display itself haughtily. I'm not going to sing like pastor because I don't sing in public. But, and it does not display itself haughtily. Now, you know, normally, now I'm sure at some churches you see this, But normally in church, we rarely see anybody display themselves haughtily, right? I mean, you know, because you got your best face forward. You know, you got your your church clothes on. You got your church face on. So you, you don't see that. But what about when we're irritated? What about when uh, that person trying to renew our warranty on our car has called 15 times? (laughs) Now, we have a tendency to want to go after them. Now, I have an app on my phone. They don't call me because it, inter- it, inter- it intercedes everything that, that, is, that, that is not in my contact. And it just goes to voicemail if it's important. So I don't get those calls, but Pastor does. And uh, he'll get sometimes three or four a day. And, you know, the love of God in us, now this may sound silly, but it's true. See, the way we act out there, that's the real us. It's not the way we act in here. It's how we act out there. And so we have to be careful that we don't get caught up and just act like the devil. Do you really want to have the attributes of the devil or do you want to have the attributes of God? And when we act the fool, we're acting like the devil. We're acting just like the devil would act. So so it is not conceited. Verse 5. This love, this love that's been shed abroad in our hearts that we all have if we're born again, this love makes us not conceited. We are not arrogant. We are not inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerly, and does not act unbecoming. Now you're thinking, so what? You're going to see so what in just a minute. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. Now y'all, I'm just going to be honest. I know pastors in the ministry that needs to get a hold of 1 Corinthians 13. Just saying. Does not insist on its own rights. He was preaching at a big, I've told this story before, but he was preaching in a large church in Alabama, and I was with him. And uh, the, the pastor, I don't think he liked women. I just picked that up. I don't, I don't know why, but I just picked up he didn't like women. And uh, 
you know, I mean, I guess because he didn't let his wife talk. He didn't let me talk. Just, we just sat there. <laughs> and, you know, that ain't me. And so anyway, uh, large, large church. And we're sitting on the front row. And a person's phone rings in the back. I thought it was funny. I just think stuff like that's funny. Sorry. And I thought he was going to come unglued. The veins in his neck popped out. And uh, he called a usher up. He was giving him an earful. And I said, oh, that poor person. Are they going to hurt him? <laughs> are they, are they going to do something to him? And so I'm sitting there thinking, oh, you know, thank God that wasn't me. And all of a sudden, my phone rang. <laughs> Y'all, I always, I, I thought I did, always silence my phone. It, you know, at Quincy's wedding, I had it silenced. I'm the mother of the bride sitting there. All of a sudden, Siri said, I don't understand what you're saying. They were saying their vows. And I thought, what nutcase didn't turn off their phone? <laughs> and then I realized, I'm the nutcase. <laughs> it was me. <laughs> but anyway, so that day, my phone starts ringing. And you know when your phone starts ringing and you're in a large auditorium, and you can't find it. You know, you're digging, women, you can, you're digging in your purse, and normally it's right there, but you can't find it, so it, quit, it keeps ringing, and it keeps ringing, and finally, I shut it off. I was red from head to toe. I, I was embarrassed. I thought he might hurt me. <laughs> I was like, honey, are you going to take up for me? <laughs> but, because he was not a, he just didn't strike me as a very loving person. And afterwards, they had a meal back in the back somewhere. It was a huge church. And so afterwards, we were walking back there. And when I walked by him, he was letting his usher have it. You, and I started saying, are you get to the usher, I started, are you getting paid for this? And I'm sure the usher would have said no. Because, you know, this is my thing. If, I, if I'm not paying you to do something, I don't have a right to jump down your throat. <laughs> you know, you don't work for me. You're working for God. Now, you, you know, of course, you correct people, but he was giving him, and I just kept walking, thought, oh, dear God, please don't stop me. Please don't stop me. I thought he was going to stop me as I walked by, but I made it to the room. I made it to the safety of the room. Now, and I'm not belittling him. After that, he died of cancer, but maybe that's what his problem was. Maybe he was going through some stuff. You know, people are going through things that we don't know about. But it, it really made me realize, of course, Pastor and I has always said this. From the very beginning, when we, when we were called into the ministry, I said, we are not going to be dictators. And I don't know why I'm getting off. Y'all, this is not in my notes. But I said, we are not going to be dictators. Because I've been in church where the pastors were dictators. And I know they meant well. I know they did. But I said, I'm never going to be mean to people. If I've ever been mean to you, I apologize. But I said, I'm never going to be mean to people. That's not God. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's the stinking guy that lives under the bridge somewhere. We are called to love. We are called to love him. And we are not called to show, part, to show uh, favoritism. Because we're all God's favorites, amen. Pastor thinks he's God's favorite, but we're all God's favorite. <laughs> Verse number six, it does not rejoice, rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Y'all know something I don't like? I don't like when the sheriff's department puts mug shots on social media. I think it's humiliating to the people. Now, my, I've never had a mugshot. I've never been arrested. I'm not talking about myself. But I think it's humiliating to the people. And I think it's... Y'all know what I'm talking about? You know, the sheriff, uh, you know, all the meth heads and all that stuff, and they just throw them up there on social media. And then people laugh at them and make the meanest comments, and then they share them so everybody will see that so-and-so in our community is in jail. I hate that. That is not love. No Christian should ever be caught doing that. It is not love to mock someone. See, the, the religious people mock Jesus. 
when he when he when they killed him when they hung him on that cross they mocked him we are his chosen people we don't mock other people because they're not like us and see what a lot of people do now we are talking about prayer we're getting there is they're so busy meddling in other people's business because hurting people hurt others. Hurting people hurt other people. But we're not called to hurt people. We're called to lift people up. Amen. So it does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness. Verse 7. Instead of praying for those people's mugshots, I mean, instead of laughing at them, we should be praying for them. Reach out to your screen and say, God, in Jesus' name, I don't know that person. I don't know what they've gone through. I don't know what, what bad decision led them to another bad decision, which led them to another bad decision, which led them where they are now, incarcerated. But, Father, you send people, Christians, across their paths to minister to them, to minister the love of God. Because God loves him or her just like he does us. Amen. Verse 7. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. Nothing should knock us down or out because love bears it. Love is ever ready to believe the best of every person, not the worst of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. Verse 8. Love never fails, never fades out, or becomes obsolete, or comes to an end. As for prophecy, it will be fulfilled and passed away. As for tongues, they will be destroyed and cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. It will lose its value and be superseded by the truth. Verse 9, for our knowledge is fragmentary. It's incomplete and imperfect. And our prophecy is fragmentary. Verse 10. But when the complete and perfect total comes, the incomplete and imperfect will vanish away. Verse 11. Now listen to this. When I was a child, I taught like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Now that I have become a man or woman, I am done with childish ways and have put them aside. We don't have hissy fits when things don't go our way. We don't throw temper tantrums when things don't go our way. That's what two-year-olds do. Amen. You know, you've been in Walmart before, and Lord, help that child. I feel sorry for that mom. You'll be a sick kid in the middle of the aisle just pitching a temper tantrum. They're two. They think that's how they get their way. But that's not how Christians get their way. We don't pitch temper tantrums. Verse 12. For now we are looking in a mirror that gives only a dim reflection of reality. We sh but, when the per but when perfection comes, we shall see in reality and face to face. Now I know in part... But then I shall know and understand, even in the same manner as I have been, fully and clearly known and understood by God. Verse 13. And so faith, hope, love abide. And then in my Bible, in parentheses, it says faith, the conviction and belief respecting men's relationship to God and divine things. Hope joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation and love true affection for god and man growing out of god's love for and in us these three but the greatest of these is love love is greater than faith love is greater than hope and hope and faith work by love because love is the greatest of the three now, you know, as we were reading these passages, you may have been sitting there thinking, wow, I got a long way to go. 
I'm just, I'm just not that person. That's not me in the mirror of the word. I don't see that. Well, you know, you don't despair because there's been a lot of times over the years that I'll read a scripture and I'll say, wow, I'm not there yet. And so I begin to meditate on it and meditate on it. I don't pitch a hissy fit and wonder why I'm not there yet. It's because I haven't meditated on the word. I hadn't gotten it down in me and just chewed on it and meditated on it. And it becomes a reality and speak it. And so if you have a problem walking in these areas, you know, we've all missed it. <laughs> I mean, I dare say we've missed the loved walk several times in our Christian. I may even say hundreds of times. I'm talking about us as a people have missed it in the love walk. Because, you know, there's been times when we've been impatient. There's been times when we've been the opposite of what all these scriptures says. But it's something that we are to reach for. And we are to say, you know, God, I don't believe you would have put it in the Bible if it wasn't obtainable for us. I don't believe you would have told us these things if we couldn't actually walk in it. But you know, as we meditate, we keep getting better. As we grow in God, we keep getting better. And, and, uh, and we ask God to help us walk in love. You know, every morning, you should get up and say, well, I always say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be God. That's the first words that come out of my mouth because I'm the first one up in my household. I come up before the sun. I get up before the sun. And uh, I get up and I say, Lord, this is the day that you have made. I, I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. I choose not to walk by my feelings today. I choose to walk in the word of God, and I will confess the word, and then I plead the blood over all my kids, my husband, my grandkids, the church family, you know, all of y'all, plead the blood, and that no weapon formed against you shall prosper as you go your way that day. So that's what I like to do. First thing, before I've had coffee, you know, I drink decafs. So I'm a sissy coffee drinker. But before I have coffee, he calls my coffee sissy. I drink instant. He has all these machines and stuff I drink instant I just I don't see the anyway and so he's a gourmet coffee connoisseur I drink instant Folgers that's just I think it's better than Starbucks I'm sorry it's just good <laughs> and so so even before I've had my decaf coffee which you know it has a little caffeine but before I've had my decaf coffee I speak to my day of how it's going to be. And so when roadblocks come up, which they probably will, not prophesying it, but you know we live in, we're in this world. And so when roadblocks come up during the day, I remember what I said that morning, and when I'm tempted, and I'll be honest, sometimes we give in to those temptations, don't we? When I'm tempted to worry or tempted to fret or tempted to, to get all upset about something, I remember what I said the, when I got up that morning that this is a day that the Lord has made and all is well with me. And everyone loves me and I love everyone. That's also my confession. And so as we meditate and we ask God, to help us walk in his love, he'll do it. He will do it. He will meet you where, you're, where you are. Now, let, now we're, now we're going to talk about the prayer part. Effective prayers walk in love. Show me a person that doesn't walk in love, and I will show you an ineffective prayer. Now, they may say all the right things and pull all the right levers and ring all, and, and ring all the bells, but remember, that's just, that's just a noise to God. If it's not done in love. That's just a noise to God. We don't want to be just a noise. We don't want to be just a noise to him. We want to, we want to walk in what he's called us to do. Now if you will. 
uh, you can turn in your Bibles or you can look at the screens. In Mark 11, 23 and 24, written by Brother Hagin. No, it wasn't written by Brother Hagin. Some people think it was written by Brother Hagin. Uh, it says this, verse 23, Truly I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. Verse 24. For this reason I am telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you and you will get it. Well, yippee yay yay <laughs> yippee yay k or however you say it. That's great. I mean, that is two great verses. I mean, we we have we have uh, we've we have lived these verses for years, lived them for years. But sometimes, sometimes, we forget verse twenty-five in that same chapter. Verse twenty-five. Verse twenty-five says, "And whenever you stand praying." Or also whenever you sit praying. Can't get out of this by sitting down. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him, let it drop, let it go, in order that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. Remember, we judge ourselves by our intentions but we judge others by their actions. We have a tendency. We shouldn't, but we have a tendency. You could do the same thing that somebody else did, and, you're gonna, and you will judge them for their actions, but then you judge yourself, what? Well, I meant well. I meant well. You know, I meant well. So, you know, I'm not going to judge myself. But I'm going to judge others doing the same thing that I've done. And that's not how it goes. Amen? That is not how it goes. We have to forgive everyone. And I'm going to tell how you know you've forgiven somebody. I'm, I'm going to tell you. You want to know how you know you've actually forgiven somebody. You're in Target. And you round the end of the aisle. And you almost bump into that person that did you wrong. That person that was mean to you. That was what you perceived just did you so dirty. And when you see that person, your, your stomach doesn't go, Ugh! You're able to see them and nothing. Now, I'm not saying you have to be best friends, but you're able to see them. And I've told this story. It's very funny. When I was in high school, I hung out with a girl older than me. I didn't have my license yet. She had her license. This is the only thing I can think of that I, ha that I had to, I mean, I, there's been other things, but this was a biggie back then. You know, everything's a biggie to a high school kid. And so uh, she was my bestie, best friend. She, st she spent the night with me all the time. And uh, she had a car, and I didn't yet because I was, didn't have my license. And so, so my boyfriend and I, I mean, you know, we couldn't. I was 15, so I couldn't really date. But you know how you leave, leave the house, and then you, you get together. But uh, so, <laughs> you know. And so anyway, uh, the fair was in town, the big fair. You know, the, not the little ones at the, but you know, the big fair was in town. Well, it was big back then, you know. A lot of things look big back then that weren't so big now. Like the big block we used to go around. It's not as big as it was in my hometown. But anyway, so uh, my boyfriend, he was the superintendent of the school's son. And he was my boyfriend. And so we, we would get with her, and then we would go and do. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, just go ride around or whatever, and so the fair was in town, so we went to the fair. And you know how you walk around the fair, you hold hands, and he tries to win you a bear, never did. Uh -huh. But anyway, <laughs> so, and so, you know, we do that, and then I have to be home by my curfew. Well, she takes me home first. 
I didn't think anything about it. We were best friends, besties. And so she took me on first, BFFs, and not anymore, but anyway, BFFs. And so lo and behold, I hear through the grapevine that they're going together behind my back. And he's, he's a year younger than me, so he's two years younger than her. And that's a lot in high school age. <laughs> and so it broke my heart. Broke my heart. Oh, I just hated her. I mean, I just, I just wanted to get her back. Have you ever wanted to get somebody back? But she didn't have, well, she had my boyfriend. She didn't have her own, so I couldn't go. I couldn't get her back. And so, but, you know, and we wound up... <laughs> We, went, we ended up going our separate ways. And you know, when I got born again at 21, I realized not that I, oh, I'm, I mean, you know, we would have never got married or anything like that, but not that any of that, but I realized that I still didn't like her because of that. I didn't like her. I was still mad at her. Now, I'm 20, I've lived in Atlanta all these years. I mean, you know, I'm sophisticated now. You know, she's still in the small town. I'm in Atlanta. I think I'm something. And so, um, so I would go home, and if somebody mentioned her name, it would just rub me the wrong way. It was like, and you know, one day the Lord said, you need to grow up. Has the Lord ever spoke? Sometimes he has to get rough with, not mean, but sometimes he has to be commanding to me. Maybe I don't listen very well. And he said, you know, you got to let that go. That's stupid. I mean, you're 21 years old. 20, I'm, I'm sorry, 20 years old. This happened when you were 15. That was five years ago, and you still don't like her for that? Because, see, after we broke up, I wasn't his first cousin. I got him back. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, I had to let that go. And, you know, and, 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 and I'm going to tell you what happened. Even after I moved, while I was in Atlanta, my mom would call and she'll say, guess who came by to see me today? And she'd say that girl's name. I think, why is she coming to my house? What's she doing in my house? I hope you didn't talk. I hope you weren't nice to her. And Mama would say, now, Allie, you know what the Bible says. And I'm like, yeah. And so, but that day, I had to forgive that thing. And now it's just hot. It's just pathetic. But back then, it was a big thing to me. And, and, and God had to make me see that we cannot hold on to grudges. And we cannot go into prayer and expect God to take us to different rooms in prayer and higher in prayer when we're still holding on to carnal things like I was holding on to. And see, God knew at the time. I didn't know. But he knew that I was going to be in the ministry one day. And I couldn't have that hanging on me, that silliness and that pettiness. And that childishness, when I was a child, I acted like a child. I, 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 I spoke like a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. And being offended is childish. It's childish. And I'm going to tell you, you'll have every opportunity in the world to get offended. Every opportunity to get a word. You know, when we were young, I think when we came here, I was 32. I was a kid. <laughs> I think when we started pastoring, right, I was 32. You added up. You're good at math. And so, anyway, we've been here a long time. And I look back and, and watch the growth. Because, you know, when you're 32, you think you know everything. But then when you get 62, you realize you don't. <laughs> you realize you don't know everything. <laughs> and realize how... Dumb I was when I thought I was so smart. But so, anyway, uh, Christians that go into to the deep things of God, the deep things of prayer, have to be mature. We have to cowboy up or man up or woman up. We have to be mature, and we have to get, back, get, get over those selfish prayers, only praying for ourselves. That's a sign of a carnal Christian if you only ever pray for yourself, you and yours, me and mine, my wants, my needs, 
by everything. So we have to get, get past that. I remember years ago when I read a book by Brother Hagen. I don't even remember the name of the book. I mean, I've read all his books. It was Requirement. We were at Rama. I've read every one of them uh, more than once. And so uh, in that book, he talked about how he didn't spend a lot of time praying for his kids. I thought, what? That was right after I read where his wife said, you wouldn't worry if we all dropped dead. And he said, why would there be any sense worrying then? And so, in, but, he, but he said, <laughs> but he, exactly. But he said in this book that he didn't spend a lot of time praying for his kids. He just spoke the word over them. And then he went on into detail, which I don't have time to get into tonight. And I said, you know what? If it'll work for Brother Hagen, it'll work for me. I realize I don't have to worry about my kids. I don't have to spend hours and hours praying over my kids. I can speak the word only. Speak the word only over my kids. And I've seen things come to pass by doing that. And so I started decreeing and declaring how it was going to be. And if they got off track and started dating somebody that I knew wasn't right for them, I broke that thing in the spirit so quick it would make their head spin because I knew it was not the right path for them. You know, the Holy Ghost will show you things. And so in, in Psalm 138.8, it says, The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. So if he's perfecting that which concerns me, why do I have to pray for me all the time? I don't. We have to yield to him in prayer. You know, uh, we all, we, we, there's all kind of scriptures about trusting God. There are songs about trusting him, how we should trust him, and we should. Uh, like trust and obey, for there's no other way. You know, we're, we're to trust him. We sing songs about trusting God. We, uh, we talk about trusting God. We read scriptures like Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. So we know without a doubt that we are to trust God. But I have a question for you. Can God trust God? you can God trust me can he trust me with important things to pray about can he trust me by looking at my track record can he trust me can God we trust God but can God trust us now I'm going to close with a story you you may have heard it before but one night in prayer uh, pastor wanted me to talk, and I'm going to talk briefly, about the rooms in prayer where God takes you in prayer. I lead prayer. Well, I'm actually, I don't do it every Wednesday night because I'm training some of the young people. How many of you know that the young people have to get involved? Because they, they're the leaders of tomorrow. If Jesus doesn't come back, I'm going to die when I'm 120 or so. I'm going to live to be at least 103, Jiminy Cricket. And so... Uh, but And so for, if, if Jesus don't come back, the church needs to go on. It's not, it's not our church. It's not mine and pastor's church. It's his church. And so it has to go on. And so I've been instructed by the Holy Ghost to start getting the younger people involved in prayer. Amen. And now some people, if I asked to pray, to lead prayer, they would just drop, you know, right that second because they're just not... I remember those days. I remember the first time I prayed with uh, Karen Mosley and people like that years ago. It was awesome, and I learned. And so, so one night in prayer, we, I was up here leading prayer. It was Wednesday night, and I, I walk when I pray. Most of the time I walk. I, I guess, you know, when we used to have the phones that, or on the wall, I'd walk when I was on the phone with the long cord. And so I walk when I'm, when I'm talking to God, mostly. And so we were praying, and all of a sudden, he just took me up in the spirit. 
And I wasn't aware of anybody in here or anybody doing anything. And while I'm up there with God, I saw to his right hand over about, you know, where Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. I saw all these chairs and they were covered in fine, like linen and, the, you know, the just lightweight. And, and it was just all white. All these chairs, I mean, they were beautiful chairs. And they had the names of people on the chair. And it was, it was in gold. The names were, uh, I, I don't know, the, like, th like gold threads with the names of the people. Names of people. People I didn't know. People in this church. But the names of people. But there was no one sitting in the chair. There was no one there. And I thought, God... Why are you showing me all these empty chairs? And this is what he said. He said, take your seat. It's a finished work. And he kept saying, take your seat. And so I've gotten to the point when I'm leading prayer and he starts saying something like that, it usually means for me to start re repeating after him. And so I started saying, take your seat. Take your seat. In the name of Jesus, Take your seat. Take your seat. And I, and I don't know what the people were doing here because I didn't see them. I didn't know they were here. I, I was completely caught up. And so then he said, it's a finished work. It's a finished work. So I'm down here saying, take your seat. It's a finished work. Take your seat. It's a finished work. And, 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 then, he said, and then he said to me, and I was repeating what he said. He said, walk by faith. And stay seated high above all the circumstances and problems and disease and poverty and lack. So I repeated it. And then he, he, he shared Ephesians 2, 6 with me. Where it says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And he was telling me to tell the people that we are to use our authority. Because... In him, we're seated high above, high above in those seats, in him. But yet, he showed me in this vision that a lot of Christians are still way down here and they're fighting people when, you know, we don't wrestle against people or wrestle against principalities and powers. But our wrestle is not that we're fighting them. He, it is a finished work. He has already done everything that's going to ever be done about our lives, about our salvation, about our prosperity, about any of the things that we need. He's already done it. And he was telling me there's empty seats up here because the people don't know to take their place. They do not know. They've been taught it, but they haven't done it. They need to take their place high above, high above all principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, high above those things, seated with Jesus. And you know, when you're seated with Jesus, high above, you look down and all those problems that look so huge when you're down here trying to fight them all, trying to do it on your own self, that looks so huge. When you're up here seated with Jesus, oh, they look so tiny. They look so tiny. Because as we magnify him from our place of authority, we see that the problems are under our feet. And he's already defeated the devil. All we do is speak the word to keep the devil at bay because he's already been defeated. Amen. Right. I'm going to close with this scripture. Ephesians, these two scriptures. Ephesians 6, 18. Pray at all times in the spirit with all manner of prayer. To that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and, and, and perseverance, interceding on behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people, and then James 5, the latter part of verse 16, one of my favorite scriptures, says the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic 
and it's working. I'm telling you, church, God wants us to come up higher into different rooms with him. He wants us to pray out his plans and his purposes, not only in Faith Family Church, but in our community, in our nation, and in the world. Isn't it an honor for God to choose or to use us to pray out his plans in the last days? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, how many of you have made your mind up, I'm going to walk in love? I want my prayer life to be effective, so I'm just going to choose to walk in the love of God. I appreciate my wife being so transparent. It reminded me of when she was sharing earlier, it reminded me of something that a friend of mine who's pastored for several years is on the mission field now. He posted this uh, recently. And I just thought it was something that every one of us needs to keep in mind. Um, well, I sent you the wrong one, Rebecca. My phone went dead. <laughs> but basically what he was saying was this. You know, so many times ministers are not transparent enough with their congregation. And when they do that, they create a wrong perception in the minds of the people. You know, she told on herself a couple of times, for example, you know, the story about, you know, holding unforgiveness and holding grudge uh, against that girl that used to be her best friend. And so we want you to know that God, I heard this said many years ago. You know how you'll, you'll be sitting in services and it might have been 30 years ago or 40 years ago and you remember one thing that was said. I can just take you through the years and tell you one statement that was said. I can't tell you anything else was said. But I heard somebody say one time, that God does not call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. Now, you and I both know that many are called, but few are chosen. And there's a reason why that is so. You see, God is looking for people that are answer the call, people to say, yes, Lord. For example, prayer. How many of you know that God is, we've been talking about this for six months now. The Lord is really looking for people that will answer the call to be an intercessor. Somebody that he can call upon day or night. I need someone to pray about this situation. Something's happening in the nation's capital right now. A law is about to be passed that's going to be bad for unborn children or for the, or the body of Christ. I need somebody to pray for missionaries on the field right now whose life is in danger. You see, God is just looking for people simply to say, yes, Lord, I will answer that call. We've all missed it. We've all made mistakes. We've all had failures in our lives. But how many of you know that God wants us to learn from that? He doesn't want us to say, well, you know, I tried once to be a good prayer warrior, and it just, you know, I was a failure. Listen, all you've got to do is just say, Lord, here am I. I want to be everything that you want me to be. Amen? You know, Paul talked about in one place that he wasn't out to dominate their faith. He wanted to help them in their joy. You know, we don't want to dominate anybody's faith. We simply want to help you as pastors. We want to feed the Word of God. We want to teach you how to flow with the Holy Spirit. One of the things I learned so long ago was there's two rivers. One's the river of the Word, and the other's the river of the Spirit. And, and so we watched through the years. It was prophesied to me back in 2005 that, you know, God had taught me to learn to flow in both rivers. Brother Hagin used to say, you know, if you've got a, if all you have is teaching of the word, you'll dry up. But if all you have is the move of the spirit, he said, you'll blow up. But if you have both, you'll grow up. I want to be an example in word and deed. Brother Hagin said, there's a move of the Holy Ghost that's going to be lost if it's not taught and demonstrated. So that's the reason I make myself available to the spirit of God anytime. I mean, if he wants me to shout, I'm going to shout. If he wants me to dance, I'm going to dance. We want our lives to be transparent. We want everybody to know, hey, we've, we've had to learn. We've had to grow. We started where, where everybody else has to start. I can still remember when the Lord connected me. We literally moved from one town to another town, not knowing why except God said to move there. After we moved there, I met a woman in the de dentist office, a, a new dentist office, just for, uh, you know, just to have my teeth clean. 
who was a dental hygienist, got to talking to her, asked her what she saved. She said, yeah, I just got saved. And I said, where do you go to church? You ever heard of Kenneth Hagin? And I'm thinking, Kenneth Hagin? I know Kenneth Hagin is not the pastor of the church in this town. I said, what do you mean? She said, uh, a guy just moved here to this town from Jacksonville, Florida, who's a Rama graduate and started the church. Right then, I knew it was, that's the reason God told us to move there. We connected with them, and we grew under them. And eventually, of course, we went to Rama ourselves, and God brought us here. But we we're on the edge of something really big. Now, I'm just telling y'all, we're on the edge. Did y'all see how many first-time, second-time, third-time guests was here Sunday morning? I and mean, several of these people are moving into the area. You say, well, why would anybody leave Matthews? Why would anybody leave Indian Trail or wherever to move to some little place like this? Because God wants them to be here. God wants people to be here. He told me, I'm going to bring you the help that you need. And God's bringing help. We want to win the lost. Like my wife said, we love everybody the same. If you know me, you know I'm going to reach out. I don't care if he is drunk and he stinks like a dog. I'm telling you, I'm going to love that man or woman or whoever just as much as I love the millionaire that walks in. We're going to treat everybody the same, always have, always will. But that's the love of God. And God is looking for people that will allow him to pour his love onto this world through them. So you just got to say, Lord, here am I. I have the Holy Ghost in me. The love of God has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to suppress it. I'm not going to do anything to hold it down. I'm just going to just act the way you want me to act, love people. It's just a matter of just choosing to walk by faith and walk in the love of God, to walk in the Spirit. You ought to get up every morning, look in the mirror. Today, I choose to walk in love. Today, I choose to walk by faith. Today, I choose to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, to just do everything that God wants me to do. Amen. Say what he wants me to say. Go where he wants me to go. Be led by the Holy Spirit. If you will begin to do this, and I'm going to keep saying it. He reminded me recently to say it more and tell the people this more and more. Determine the way you want your life to go. Point your tongue in that direction. Get up in the morning and determine what kind of life do I want to live today. Amen. And just point your tongue in that direction and then follow your tongue. Amen. That's all you got to do. Hallelujah. Praise God. Isn't God good? Oh, the Lord is so good. I want you to stand up for a moment, if you would. And I want you to join hands with somebody. And I want you to pray this prayer after me. Father God, I choose today to live a life of love. I walk by faith. That means I agree with you. I agree with your word. I agree with heaven. I want heaven on earth. I want your will in my life. And I want it for everybody else. So I choose to walk in love because I want my faith to work to the very best. I choose to love people, those that love me and those that don't love me. I love my enemies, those that try to be enemies. I refute, I resist the enemy by showing love. I release the love of God that's in my heart, put there by the Holy Spirit, by my words and by my deeds. And Father God, I pray for the person next to me and those all around me that every one of us would abound more and more in your love. Show us, Holy Spirit, changes that we need to make, adjustments in our attitudes that we have toward others. Help us, Lord. Remind us every day, right before we step out of love. Show us, Lord, and help us to make the right decision because we want to be everything you created us to be. We want to do everything that you have called us to do as a people as a family of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.